for you, Ward. I'm Sean Hart. I'm a nurse practitioner with the cardiovascular surgeons, and I've been asked to come talk to you today about ECMO. So ECMO is a new program that Parkview has started about this time last year. Dr. Greenlee and Dave Wilkins, one of our perfusionists, um, went to a conference in Chicago, I believe, about ECMO, and thought, you know, we send a lot of people out to like University of Michigan and IU for ECMO, so they decided that it was something that they wanted to try to bring to Parkview, so here we are. So now we are four patients in to our ECMO program here, so I'm just going to kind of go over the basics with you. Um, these are just some terms that are kind of used interchangeably. Extracorporeal life support is just a general, all-encompassing terminology. Extracorporeal means outside of the body. So uh, ECMO then is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, which is kind of like a VAD, only with an added oxygenator. So if that kind of makes it click in your mind. This is Dr. Bartlett, and he is known as kind of the godfather of ECMO. This is just a brief history. Um, he founded ELSO, which is the governing body, the organization where we submit our data, and um, they have a website with lots of information about ECMO and guidelines and things like that. So, um, so yeah, and he's still talking. I went to a conference just last month. Um, the annual ELSO conference, and he was there, so he's still around. Um, this is a picture of what ECMO looked like initially. So this was the first guy who was supported. He was an aortic injury after a motorcycle accident, and this was, I believe, in Santa Monica, California. So he was supported. I've seen, I've read anywhere from this 1.5 to a week as far as his, his um, the length of his run. So he survived. This was the first neonatal uh, ECMO survivor, maybe Esperanza. This was in 1975. So as you can see, it's been around a while. So um, initially in the 70s, the research um, wasn't very favorable and the research itself was kind of flawed. The centers that they um, included hadn't done ECMO before, and you can see over here on the right is kind of the obstacles that they had run into during the course of the study, and they actually stopped it a third of the way in because both arms of the study, the survival was less than 10%, so ECMO kind of went away for a while, and then it seems like with the H1N1 flu, it kind of came back into favor. So this is as of this year, this is January of this year, you can see our survival to transfer statistics uh, nationally. The neonatal population is what is circled up there in the right hand corner. The 74% survival is the neonatal respiratory cases, which is your babies with endothelial aspirations. So they do really well on that one, as you can see. And then down in the bottom right corner is the adult statistics. And the respiratory, or the BB, um, has a pretty good survival rate, about 60%, and then kind of drops off with the cardiac and then the eCPR which eCPR is when you put someone on ECMO during active CPR, so during chest compressions, um, the survival is not that, that great. And actually, that's what our first case was here at Parkview. It was kind of out of the blue, not what we had expected to start with, but it was a young 40-something-year-old uh, woman who collapsed at the gym, and um, she got about an hour of CPR before we actually put her on, before we actually cannulated her. So um, she she did not survive. She had neurological injuries that, that weren't reversible. So this is just a picture of the process of 
lung injury um, that we see with like the ARDS patients. Just picture of normal versus arch chest x-ray and then the right is what you see at a cellular level that's an alveoli and you can see um, down here the kind of globs of um, junk that is at the cellular level and you can see how there would be problem with oxygen transfer then and this, this little house, I always have to laugh, because this, this is a slide that Dave Wilkins put in here, and I don't know if you all know Dave, but he's, he's a who. So he said, you can't take that slide out. That makes the whole talk. And what it is, is it's just kind of a picture of the surface area of the human lung. So adult humans have about 70 square meters of alveolar surface area, and this house is one. So a lot of surface area. And then over here, this is showing where we like to intervene on these patients. So the exudative stage, which is basically what we looked at on a cellular level in the last slide, this is the stage that we want to catch these people in. This is where things are reversible. And this is after about five days, five to seven days on the ventilator. We're still in the stage. After that, after that seven day mark, you're starting to get into the proliferative stage where you have like the irreversible fibrosis. So um, after that, it's not really a reversible process anymore. This is a picture of our equipment. We use the Centromag pump. So this is our console and our um, display screen and just the pump head. This is our oxygenator. So these two together, the um, diamond-shaped oxygenator is essentially the patient's lung. And then the pump head down here in the right-hand corner is the heart. So um, you really need very little heart and lung function, native function, because we do it all. We are the heart and lungs when we have someone on support like this. So this would be someone who was centrally cannulated, what we would call centrally cannulated. So this is someone who had open heart surgery and failed to come off the bypass. So they left their equipment in there and just kind of attached our tube to, to what they were working with and, and they're supporting that way. This is a picture of a femoral So this would be VA, and I'm going to get to that in a minute, the difference between VA and PE ECMO. So the VA is, um, we're supporting heart and lungs. So we're going into a femoral artery and then a femoral vein. And then the other little catheter off to the side there is what we call a distal reperfusion catheter. These cannulas are really big, and there have been uh, people have, who have lost limbs because of ischemia. So um, the first patient that we had, we did notice that her foot was kind of dusty and cool, and we did end up putting one of these catheters in. Now this last guy that we did, he had very big vessels, and he never had a problem. So, but that's one thing that we have to kind of fix that problem. So the BV, or the just lung support, this is the Avalon catheter that we use, and we use that on both of our BB cases. It's a very big catheter, goes into the IJ. It's the only location that it can be placed, and it has to be placed just perfectly. You can see there are intake valves in the superior and inferior vena cava, so that's where we're pulling the, the blood out of the patient, and then we're running it through our system, we're oxygenating it and pumping it back to them through this jet right here that you see has to be pointed directly at the tricuspid valve. So it has to be very exact placement, but it's worked very well. So this would be for like your patients with arms? Yes, yes. And then this is just another picture of um, a groin cannulation where they've sewn in with grass done a cut down on something with grass. 
So the difference, like I said, the BV ECMO is just pulmonary support. And we use that for the flu patients. We supported a warm water drowning, a young kid who um, drowned here locally. His first rhythm when they pulled him out was asystole. So he um, was resuscitated at the scene, arrived in STICU, and was resuscitated again and for the first 24 hours before we put him on his best blood gases his pH was like 7.14 and his PO2s were in the 30s so he was going nowhere quickly so we put him on a BD cannulation with the Avalon catheter and supported him for about six days and he's planning his wedding so he did great, no, no deficit. So um, CO2 retention, we can. This is very efficient at removing CO2. Um, it's just a dial, a matter of changing the sweet gas, and we can correct um, um, the PCO2 like within an hour. It's, it's very efficient. So like status asthmaticus and, and stuff like that. Um, it's been used for that. Uh, the VA ECMO is the heart and lung support. So when we talked about post-cardiotomy failure to come off the pump, um, cardiac failure, uh, cardiogenic shock, uh, those sorts of things. Drug overdose, we, uh, when we went to IU, we did see a woman that was being supported on ECMO that was a drug overdose. and pulmonary embolism is another indication that we can use this for. There are some relative contraindications. Um, we do have to anticoagulate the patient, so they can't have any contraindications to anticoagulation, so no bleeding in the head, no recent bleeding in the belly, that sort of stuff. Terminal disease state, um, malignancy, and you know there are studies coming out now too where they are actually putting people that have malignancies on ECMO. Um, that research data is not available yet, but that is something that they're that I know that they're working on. Um, moderate to severe chronic lung disease. Like I said, there has to be kind of an end goal. You know, it has to be reversible. So we have to be doing this you know, to get to. Uh, at least their their baseline state of health. So, prolonged CPR without adequate tissue perfusion. We did uh, go ahead and put that lady on that had arrested. Um, she had good CPR or CPR. I, they started doing CPR in the ER. Is what happened. So it was witnessed, and they knew that she had good perfusion the whole time. So. So what happens once we think that we have somebody, or you think you have somebody, it is a collaborative decision between whoever's going to be cannulating, which will be one of the CV surgeons, and then whoever is referring the patient. So it could be a cardiologist in the cath lab, it could be an intensivist in the ICU, you know, whoever it is that thinks their patient needs ECMO, then usually it's me getting those those two people together to have the conversation. Um, we do have a paging cascade that goes through the operator, and so far I've been the one calling that. There's several people that get paged for an ECMO activate, like the CDICD charge and lab and the OR and the surgeons. What do we need to do before that heparin bolus? If there is someone that we're considering, you'll see me kind of nosing around to see what the patient has and what they're going to need. We like to have feeding tubes in. We like to have central access. You know, anything invasive that we can foresee that they're going to need, we like to have that in before we get that big heparin bolus to cannulate. will have an ECMO consent form. It's still kind of going through the hospital channels. 
Right now, we've just been using just the standard um, procedure <coughs> consent form. There are order sets in EPIC. There's a pre-cannulation order set that has um, labs that we like to have. It also has those reminders, you know, do you have central access, do you have a feeding tube, do you have a right radial art line, um, that sort of thing. And then there's the uh, post-cannulation order set, which is more lengthy and has like your ventilator settings and everything like routine labs for three days out and that sort of thing. Um, ECMO folders, there is a packet that we keep at the bedside. There's a lot of paper charting that I have to do just to keep track of, you know, what we're inserting when and keeping track of times because we do enter our data into the ELSA database then. So. seen these rooms, you see that there are, there are two nurses at the bedside, and one of them is what we call the ECMO specialist, and that is one of our ICU nurses that has went away for training to learn how to manage this ECMO circuit or bypass pump. Um, so that is their patient. So sometimes you'll see them sitting there and the bedside nurses will say, hey, can you help me turn this patient or can you go run this on the gym? And they cannot, they cannot leave this circuit. So if you think about it, this, this circuit is pumping blood at anywhere from three to five liters. So I mean, something happens, the stop cock pops off, I can tell you what happens when a stop cock pops <laughs> off because we just had that happen last week. Oh, we had to change the curtain in the room. Oh. So, oh. yeah, it, it, it flows fast and furious. So that's why the ECMO specialist can't leave that bedside. They can't leave the system. The bedside nurse then is the other nurse that's in the room, and that's your, your usual ICU nurse that's handling the ventilator and the drips and the routine patient care. So they have to be able to communicate very well together because um, anything that that bedside nurse is doing could potentially affect the circuit. So if they're titrating vasopressors or giving sedation or things like that, that could change your flows on your ECMO machine. So they need to be able to say, hey, this is what I'm going to do, or really any access into the ECMO circuit, they should be communicating with you know, I'm going to go to labs, or so we can be ready in case something bad happens. So that's why no, no drips to gravity. Everything has to be run on the pump. Um, if your ECMO support stops, you know, the ECMO support is your heart and lungs, so you might be Know, wean down to very minimal vasopressors. We might not even be needing vasopressors anymore. And your vent settings are very minimal. Your tidal volumes are very low. So if the system goes down for whatever reason, then you need to be prepared to maybe cope the patient. You need to be ready with your vasopressors and uh, the nurse will have to, the respiratory therapist will have to go back on the vent settings and stuff like that.
when people ask why we chose that, that's what IU uses, and they've had really good results with it. And it's nice because it's more stable than heparin, so you don't have the hourly blood draws that you would have if you were constantly adjusting heparin. It's just every four hours, so um, and we've had we've had great results with it so far too. So we haven't had any clotting issues. So accidental decannulation, which would be would be a disaster um, and pump failure. We have so the rule is if you have someone on, we have two systems, so that means we can support one patient because we always have to have a backup system then ready to go in case something bad would happen. Echo transportation. The goal is to never have to move a patient anywhere while they're on ECMO. Um, this is something, though, that we could foresee happening that we might have to do someday. So we have focused a lot of our simulations on transport. We've worked with the MICU or the mobile ICU, and um, we've had Mira Center come over with their mannequins, and we've practiced moving like from the ICU out to the MICU truck because with our VA patients in particular, you know, like I said, you always have to be thinking of you know what what the next step would be or what the end result would be, and for some of these people, it might be transplant. And we're not a transplant center, so that's why we've, we've practiced transport out to NICU in case we would have, ever have to send someone out. Um, we've practiced going to CT scan. Um, none, none, none of those we would want to do. So. <laughs> but if you see us coming, this is, this is us coming down the hall with our first patient. Um, we usually send a scout out in front of us to clear the hallways because it's it's a big deal. So in case disaster does happen, like I said, we would have to put the patient back on the emergency ventilator settings, which which is basically full full ventilator support. Get your vasopressors ready. We always have four units of blood on hold for these patients. Our first one who is rather unstable, we kept the four units at the bedside. So the last three have been fairly stable, so we just have the blood on hold. We haven't had to have it right at the bedside. Um, if they would have to code a patient on ECMO, the VB patients would be compressions only because we are oxygenating them with our system, so we don't have to bag them. <coughs> Excuse me. The BA patients would just be meds and defibrillation. We would not do chest compressions because we are pumping and they're circulating. Also is the organization, like I said, that kind of oversees all of the guidelines and facilities put their information into this database and they generate reports for us. It's also a very good resource. Like I said, you can get all sorts of information on there for meetings and guidelines and pretty much anything ECMO. Uh, requirements for the specialist is, just like I said, you have to have three years of critical care experience and you get the didactic lectures and simulation and we also have the girls, girls and guys, I guess we have a guy now too, they will sit then with a perfusionist at the bedside for 40 hours before we kind of turn loose on their own. And then we're always working with Miro Center for simulations doing everyday things like getting air out of the circuit or like I said, we practice transport a lot. Yeah.